Hello, this is me, Jack Nielsen, and Mr. Donovan here, and we are conducting an interview on May 18th, 2023. So let's get... Okay. Mr. Donovan, can you tell me a little bit about the picture, if you ask me? Uh, are you referring to this? Yes, the wood carvings. Okay. Uh, this is a picture that I have in my home currently now, and... Uh, or excuse me, a picture of a wood carving that I currently have on my home in a dining room buffet. Um, it's a wood carving, as you can see, at the Last Supper. Um, and I uh, purchased it in 1960 when was, I was in Oberammergau, Germany. Uh, and there's a little bit of a story behind it. Um, I was in uh, Europe uh, and southern Germany, very close to the Austrian border. Um, in 1960, my parents uh, took myself, my twin sister, and my uh, uh, brother, who was about a year and a half younger, on a uh, sort of an extended trip to, to Europe um, uh, for uh, my graduation from high school, as well as my sisters. We were graduating and going on to college the next year. And um, one of the stops we made was in this small town called Oberammergau, which is best noted uh, historically for the fact that during the Black Plague, which occurred in the uh, 14th century, the bubonic plague uh, resulted in the death of hundreds of thousands, only millions of people in Europe uh, during that time. And uh, Oberammergau is a very, very small town, extremely small town. Uh, they were worried that they would be totally wiped out, and it's pretty isolated. So they conducted an a ongoing prayer service every day to, to the Lord, uh, begging the Lord to have the Black Plague bypass their town, much like uh, the angel of death uh, in Egypt skipped over the, the Israelites and so forth. Well, as a matter of fact, it did. It never touched anybody in their town, and nobody in their town ever, ever got it. And in an appreciation for that, they decided to put on a passion play commemorating the passion of, uh, and, and crucifixion of Christ in their small town. They would use people in the town to play the various roles of the play. It's a long play, it lasted eight hours. Um, and uh, they put it on every 10 years, every 10 years for about four months during the uh, warm season. And people from all over the world would uh, uh, buy tickets well in advance to attend this passion play. But we just happened to be able to get five tickets through luck. We didn't have them in advance, and somebody canceled. And we went to this passion play. In addition to the passion play, the town is noted for having probably some of the finest wood carvers in all of Europe. Some people consider all of the world. They have several schools around the town and they have all their special wood carvers produce things that people see while they're there in the passion play and they uh, advertise them another way. When I walked into the town the first day, I saw this wood carving in the window uh, of a small shop uh, and I just looked at it and just sort of fell in love with it. Um, and um, I uh, uh, thought about the possibility of, of trying to inquire whether I could purchase it if I had enough money. I just sold a sailboat for $750, so that's all the money I had in the world. And on the, uh, just before we left town, I said to my dad, Dad, would you let me go to the, the wood carving place? I want to uh, see what they're asking for. It. Oh, excuse me, I had asked earlier what it was costing, and it was 11,000 marks, which is about $400 uh, in, in American money at the time. Well, I wasn't even close to that uh, as far as the money I had. I asked my dad, though, just before I left town, could we, could I go in and I'm just going to make him the offer of the 750 and see what he says. I went in, offered him 750. He sort of hemmed and hawed about it for a while. And he said, can't you elevate it? I said, that's exactly all the money I have. And he said, uh, well, I'll take it. So that's how I got this wood carving. And they shipped it over. And it arrived, uh, oh, I would say in about, uh, Oh, in about a month, I'd say, it, uh, it got to us in the United States. And it's been in my home ever since. And I treasure it uh, immensely uh, and take care of it. And there was one other one done just like it. Uh, uh, a guy was actually, who did it, was working on two of them. It took him over almost two years to do them both. 
Uh, and that particular one is in the National Shrine of uh, the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. right now, the other one. I happened to return to this site uh, about 50 years later, just uh, in 207, and drove into the small town. And there, nothing had changed. Everything looked the same. The shop was there. I, I had no problem recognize it. Drove up to it. I said, I've got to go in and find out. There happened to be another wood carving in the window, but it wasn't anywhere near as good as this one was. And I happened to ask the woman, I said, um, you know, I was here f over 50 years ago, and I bought a wood carving like this uh, from your store. And she started crying, and she said, my grandfather was running the store at that particular time. So sort of a neat part of it. So that's why I value this so much and how I came to, to own it. That's really special. It's yeah, it is. All right, next. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the, I remember during the pre-interview, you were talking about the roller skating incident. OK. Uh, well, that happened fairly early in 1962. Uh, once I moved to Milwaukee, I'm originally from the Twin Cities. And uh, I lived in St. Paul, went to high school there, and made a decision to go to Marquette University. I wanted to go away to college, and I chose Marquette University. Um, the Twin Cities uh, at that time, especially, um, uh, is, is a uh, city that uh, you would see very, very few, almost if any, African Americans back then. There were some, but you hardly ever saw them. They were in a small little enclave, let's say, uh, just in a, uh, not too far from where I lived in St. Paul, but just not many. Never any in school, grade school, or high school. Never, never even met one. Never met one. Uh, and didn't think anything of it. Um, when I got to Milwaukee, uh, I got a sort of an interesting lesson about when you have a integrated city uh, like Milwaukee, things are different. Um, and uh, it had to do with roller skating. I had a date one night, and I loved to roller skate. I loved ice skate too, because I'm from Minnesota, but I liked roller skating as well. And I asked the date if she wanted to go roller skating. She said, sure, and I was right. Uh, I think it was a on a Monday night. And so just a few blocks north of uh, Marquette University, we walked up to this roller skating rink and I went up to the ticket window and I asked the woman, I said, like two tickets please, uh, and we'll have to rent a pair of roller skates because neither one of us have them. She looked at me and she said, are you sure you want to buy tickets? And I said, yes, I, I do, I want to buy tickets. She said, well, don't you realize it's their night? I said, excuse me? And she repeated, and she said, it's their night. I said, well, first of all, what do you mean by it's their night, and who are you referring to? She says, uh, this is the night for the coloreds to skate. I said, are you telling me that I can't buy a ticket just because um, uh, some black people are choosing to skate tonight? I referred to them as black. She referred to them as coloreds. Um, and she said, well, they're the only ones that come tonight. White nights are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or, or excuse me, Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday, I can't remember. Anyway, I said, well, I don't care, it doesn't make a difference to me whether uh, uh, it's their night. It, she said, well, it's their music. And I said, I could care less what music it is, I just want to roller skate. So we bought tickets. We bought tickets. And we go in there. Uh, and my date didn't know any better, too, either, because she was from Green Bay, and there was hardly any blacks in Green Bay, except for the Packer football players. That was about the only ones. But she didn't mind at all. We go in there, and we walk into it. We get our skates on, and we go out to the rink, and everybody stops skating, looks around, and looks at us. I mean everybody. And the music stops. And I said to her, I think we should probably wait a night <laughs> and not go in. So we go take our skates off and leave. But that was my introduction to segregation uh, and the existence of uh, segregated populations being very close together and, and the distinction evidently that was being made between being white and being black. And I was astonished, absolutely astonished. So I had my eyes opened uh, for the first time in my life about 
what it was like living in large integrated cities, or at least integrated in the sense that they were relatively close together. And I'll never forget that experience. Never forget it. That's, I couldn't even imagine that. It's yeah. so no, I couldn't either. I was shocked. Absolutely shocked. But anyway, that's what happened. Were you only in there for a few minutes? And right, right. I mean, I wasn't going to press the issue. I didn't yeah. want all the people uh, uh, giving us a hard time or something like that because we were invading their night. Yeah. Uh, they were looking at us not in a pleasing way, let's put it that way. They certainly weren't welcoming us to join them, that's for sure. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Next guy, can you just tell me a little bit about your childhood and living through the 50s? Okay, uh, actually my childhood started in the 40s mostly. Uh, I, uh, I was uh, born in 1942, uh, so uh, at least, and, and, and I do have memories going all the way back to, to when I was two years old, uh, which most people don't, but I have, and it was a rather vivid memory for a reason. Um, so uh, the early part of my childhood uh, was in the 50s, and then my latter grade school years and all of my high school years uh, were in the 50s. Um, and, uh, and then my college and young adult years were in Milwaukee after that because um, I went to Marquette University, uh, and with the exception of going to the University of Minnesota for my graduate work, I've been in Milwaukee uh, ever since then, uh, teaching. Um, but going back to my, if you want me to comment about my real early childhood, yeah. uh, my, my first memory was the fact that um, growing up and being two years old and realizing that my father was not with us, because he was off in the war. Uh, and in his place was my grandfather, my mother's father, who just worshipped us. At the time, um, it was myself, my twin sister, and uh, my four-dimension uh, brother, who was about 17 months uh, younger than I was. We were, we were the three there, and my dad was gone uh, to the war. Uh, and um, so in a sense, I didn't really meet him until he occasionally would come home uh, while he was in the service, just for a, a short break, just a, a furlough. But uh, my my grandfather uh, Duffy, who was that was my mother's maiden name, was uh, the person who we were most close to, and I remember him belovedly because he would take us everywhere. He just worshipped us, and he showed me how to play baseball, and he showed me all sorts of card games, and just the fact that he wanted to spill, spend time with us. He had an old Willis Jeep. Uh, or not Willis Jeep, but a Willis car, which is sort of an old jalopy type car, um, that he would take us with, uh, take us, give us a ride in whenever he had to go shopping for for something. But anyway, he was he was a terrific guy. But uh, but I always miss my father. And um, what the, the the deal was that my dad, um, uh, when they were married. Um, uh, the draft came up right away, and, and he had just gotten married. He had just gotten married when, the, when excuse me, he had gotten married before the war broke out. Um, but uh, they were drafting people right away. Well, he, they didn't draft married people right away. They drafted unmarried men. But then very quickly they went to married men. Uh, and, but we quickly got by that because my, myself and my sister were born. Uh, uh, just in 1942, May of 42, and the war had started in December of, of 41, as far as the U.S. involvement in it. Um, so he was he was exempt from being drafted for a while, but then they were going to start drafting people with two children and even three children. And he did not want to be drafted for the simple reason that he had to go wherever they sent him. He was, he was afraid he'd be put in the infantry right away. So he, he joined the Army Air Corps. And by joining, he went into training that took about two years uh, uh, in doing that. And he was trained as, a, um, as an engineer in a B-29. A B-29 is the plane that dropped the atomic bomb. And uh, tried to make a long story short, uh, he was all set to go to Japan uh, in a B-29 uh, two weeks after the, first, the two atomic bombs were dropped. And so, therefore, the war ended before he actually saw any active service. So um, he was healthy and he returned to us, and uh, we were very grateful that way. And 
uh, it was a tough adjustment actually for my grandfather because he knew that he wouldn't be able to spend as much time with us now that my father's return. And um, while I loved both my parents very much, my father was the man I most, the person I most admired in my life. He had a tremendous influence over who I was and the decisions I made. He's just, he was just an incredible parent. And I basically modeled my, my the pattern of my existence after, after him. Uh, not that my mother wasn't a marvelous woman to raise nine children, uh, is, it's quite a task, but uh, my father was truly special. And, um, and then we, after the war, uh, they had, we had the three of us, but then right after the war, uh, we had six more children, and they came two, uh, 46, 48, 40, 50, 52, 53, and 58, just bing, bang, bang, right after another. And um, uh, that's how my mother was busy. <laughs> and so was my father. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so those are some of the events that, that I remember about my early childhood. One other big event that had a big impact on me was baseball. I loved baseball. Um, and one of the reasons I liked it is in St. Paul, uh, our farm team, the St. Paul Saints, we were a farm team of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And I loved the Brooklyn Dodgers because of that. And the Brooklyn Dodgers started to be on TV in 1947, which was an important year for the Brooklyn Dodgers because that's when uh, Jackie Robinson joined their team. So I became a huge Dodger fan for that reason, and I watched them uh, uh, do very, very well in the late 50s and all through the middle 50s and even into the later 50s. My dad was a Yankee fan, and I couldn't stand the Yankees. And you'd have to be a baseball uh, person back then to know uh, how the Yankees and the Dodgers were always playing each other in the in the early 50s and mid 50s. Those were that's, they called them the Subway Series. Uh, Brooklyn and and uh, and New York was in the in the Bronx. There, at least the Yankees were in the Bronx, and they were great World Series. That they were just. Um, terrific uh, competition between the two and I was so eventually grateful that finally the Dodgers won in 1955 because the Yankees killed them, uh, not killed them, but beat them every year before before that. And my dad was always needling me about being a supporter of the Dodgers. But anyway, uh, and I played baseball and I was good at it. Uh, and uh, so baseball became a big part of my life. And it became even a bigger part of my life in 1957, and I'll tell you the, the little story there, is I just happened to, in 1957, we live in St. Paul, my dad was running a business, and they had some business out in New York. So uh, he had to go out to do some business in New York, and he took my mother along, and he took me along. He asked if I could be excused from school. This was in October. And um, he said, uh, we're going out, Mike, and we've got some business in Montreal, and then um, and we also have some business in New York, and we're taking a drive through uh, the New England states. We're going to end up in New York because I've got tickets to the first two games of the World Series in New York. And I'd never seen a major league ball game. So my first experience of seeing a major league ball team was in Yankee Stadium in the upper deck of Wright Field in 1957. Do you know who the Yankees were playing in 1957? The Dodgers? No. They were playing the Milwaukee Braves. Oh. They were playing the Milwaukee Braves. And that was the first time the Milwaukee Braves, in, being in Milwaukee, won the World Series. They won the World Series against the Yankees that year. But I saw the first two games in Yankee Stadium, and they were the first ball game, major league games I ever saw. That was a thrill. That was a real thrill. So I guess enough about baseball. <laughs> Well, just a follow-up question. Were you rooting for the Braves or the Yankees? It was a good, I didn't care. I really didn't care. Because next year the Dodgers were in, uh, the, two, the, the Braves lost in 57, but or they won in 57, but lost in 58. And they were both 4-3 series. But in 59, the Dodgers won the World Series, so I was happy again. <laughs> That's good. But I became a Braves fan. Eventually, keep in mind, I had moved to Milwaukee. I, didn't, I never knew I was even going to come to Milwaukee. This is three years before I ever even came to Milwaukee. I didn't know I was going to come to Milwaukee until August of 1960 when I decided to 
come to Marquette. Yeah, that's good. We can transition to that. So why did you decide to, why did you choose Marquette? I wanted to go to way, away to school. So I definitely, and I applied at three schools, Notre Dame, Marquette, and St. University of St. Louis. I was all set to go to Notre Dame, a uh, beautiful school, and they were real strong in science, which I was interested in. Uh, but then I decided, I, I changed my mind at the very end, because two guys that had preceded me, were older than I, from the high school that I went, were at Marquette, and they heard that I was choosing Marquette, or excuse me, choosing Notre Dame over Marquette, and they called me up and said, they said to me, Mike, you'd be making the biggest mistake of your life if you if you uh, go to Notre Dame and don't go to uh, Marquette University. And I said, why? And he said, well, first of all, <laughs> Notre Dame is out of the middle of nowhere, and they're right about that. <laughs> South, <laughs> Notre Dame, is, South Bend, first of all, isn't very big, and Notre Dame is way out in the countryside, and there isn't much around Notre Dame even today. Uh, and it's uh, all male, which it was at the time, and uh, uh, yeah, Marquette is near downtown, lot to see, lot to do. Uh, people from all over the country, of course, people all over the country in Notre Dame, too. Uh, girls are there, which, and I never had been in school with girls since grade school, so I thought that, that, that'll be nice. So I said, okay, fine, give me something else. And they said, well, if you want to come home to, to St. Paul, it's a lot easier to get home to St. Paul from Milwaukee than it is South Bend. Point granted. Uh, that's true, too. I want one more, at least one more good reason better than the first two. They said, well, I'll tell you what, Notre Dame has bed check every night at 10 o'clock during the school days and at 10.30 on the weekends. We don't have any bed check at Marquette University any night. I said, I'm coming. <laughs> I'm coming. So that was pretty much the reason I chose Marquette. But it was probably the best decision I ever made because I would not have been exposed to Jesuit education. The reason being that there was no Jesuit schools at the time, and for even years after that, um, uh, in the Twin Cities. So I would have never been exposed to Jesuit secondary education had I not come to Marquette and heard of uh, Marquette High School and had at least some contact with Marquette High School a little when I was in college. And after I... Um, Finished my graduate work at the University of Minnesota. Uh, an opportunity <laughs> unexpectedly arose, uh, recommended by the, the, the professor I worked under at the University of Minnesota, that there was a couple of Jesuit schools in Minnesota that might be able to use my, um, my skills. The first one was Campion High School, which you probably don't remember. That was a Jesuit high school in um, in Prairie du Chien, which is over on the Mississippi River, uh, pretty much straight west of Madison. Um, Prairie du Chien is a very small town, but it was a Jesuit uh, boarding school. Uh, almost all the students were resident students, and a lot of them were sh from Chicago. The, the story was that Chicago people would want to send their wayward sons to <laughs> be sort of trained by the Jesuits to uh, assume some attitude changes and so forth uh, while they were under the, the uh, mentorship of the, of the Jesuits. But it was a very successful high school. But they offered me a position there to teach biology, um, but I couldn't conceive of raising a family there. So the principal of the school that I was interviewing with uh, directed me to Marquette saying that there was a job, Marquette High, there was a job in chemistry and that I should go there. And I went over and I was hired. And, with the exception of a two-year stint at Holy Angels, I've been here ever since. Wow. Um, just going back, you said Notre Dame had, uh, what do you call it, that lights out? Was that true? They yeah. Had the yeah. Everybody had to be in their room. Wow. Bet check it, yeah. This is a long time ago, Jackson. Yeah, I can't, I yeah. can't even imagine that yeah. now. Well, they didn't want to run, there were students running all over the cornfields, uh, whatever. Yeah, they had a uh, bed check. That's crazy. <laughs> it is. Well, and I was pleasantly surprised that Marquette University didn't. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask now, um, kind of shifting the mood, uh, or the questions a little bit, to uh, the anti-war protest. Did you, was there anything at that? Um, uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, 
I wasn't really involved in the anti-war protests, not like that occurred in Madison. Uh, 1968 was a tough year because that's when sentiment against the Vietnam War began to really flourish. It, there was some sentiment already, but it really flourished. And one of the cities that it really flourished in was Madison. Um, there was some physical damage done to the, the physics uh, lab and physics rooms at Madison by some rioters. Uh, some people were hurt. Nobody was uh, injured seriously or anything like that, but they had some riots there. The students that we had at Marquette High at the time, the class of 68, were not the easiest kids to get along with. They were, they were by far, by far, the toughest group of kids that, that, uh, that I ever had at Marquette High to teach. Uh, not that they were so bad to me personally, but they were awful mean to each other. Awful mean to each other. It was just a tough group to, to deal with, and we ended up booting a lot of them out. Uh, they were they were such fun, but that was just that one year. As a matter of fact, I I was threatening to maybe not come back to Marquette High after my first year. But one of the Jesuit priests that I admired very much convinced me he said, "You'd be making a huge mistake. I'd be making a huge mistake if I left Marquette High just because of this one group of kids." And he was 100 percent right. The next year it was a great group of kids, and every year after that. So once we got through that. So I wasn't really involved that much in uh, anti-war protests uh, and um, at that time, um, although I <laughs> did get involved uh, uh, in somewhat of a scary way um, to the riots that occurred in uh, Milwaukee in 1967. I don't know if you remember or heard about the riots in, in Milwaukee in 1967. Well. Um, what was happening throughout the summer in major cities across the United States seemed to be one after another, where blacks were grouping and marching and, and destroying property, and uh, uh, there was some uh, shootings and uh, a lot of destruction of, of property, uh, both downtown and the black neighborhoods. But they were rioting uh, because uh, the black outcries for justice and, f and fair treatment and. Um, and, uh, and they resented the, uh, the prejudicial attitudes that whites were having towards blacks and so forth. Anyway, Milwaukee got caught up into it eventually, but when it broke in Milwaukee, I wasn't around. I was out of town. And that summer, I happened to be working. Uh, this was the uh, summer just before, yeah, it was, this, it, was this, it was the first summer, yeah, after my first year of teaching. And I was working for the Wisconsin Gas Company. And um, I had experience working for the gas company up in the Minnesota, so I carried those skills and, and got a summer job working for the gas company here in Milwaukee. And I was it was a summer job because I was helping to coordinate um, uh, work that uh, the crews did, the gas crews did, in terms of renewing pipe, renewing gas pipe during the summertime while the weather was nice. And I was involved in helping to organize that and make sure it went according to Hoyle. And I had to get into a lot of homes that uh, uh, were poor, rundown homes. And we were living, working in the black area. And um, I got to know a number of people in the black area. And they were just the nicest people. And, but they lived in squalor. It was just, just terrible. Uh, oftentimes, I had to go down their basements to check their meters downstairs, their gas meters. and the, they used their back stairs in their house as a clothes chute. All their clothes were just piled on going down the, the back stairs. And I, a number of times had to slip down the steps and to get down there. But they were very, very nice people. Anyway, uh, I w worked there for about a month. And all of a sudden, I was out of town. And I came back late on a Sunday night. And uh, unbeknownst to me, trouble had started Sunday night. I went right to bed. Got up in the morning, I was, got in my car, and I was headed for 7th and Locust or someplace like that, because that's where the area we were working right now. And I turn on the radio at 8 o'clock, and I hear about all of these reports of looting and vandalism and fires and gunshots and everything like that going on. And I thought to myself, uh, what's hap what city got it now? Little did I know it was Milwaukee, until all of a sudden somebody mentioned Milwaukee. And they had mentioned sniping, that there were snipers on tops of rooftops and shooting, shooting at cars just randomly going by. <laughs> I just turned my car around 
and went right home to get out of there because uh, that scared me. And about two weeks after the riots were over, I went back to that area. I, I felt so sorry for the poor people because so many of their homes were wrecked, burnt to the ground. They had nothing left. It was just tragic. And it wasn't their fault. They didn't do any of this. And yet the, the people that were behind the, the looting and so forth just turned on them and uh, just ruined everything they had. It was so sad. That was one of the truly disappointing things I experienced when, it, when I was in Milwaukee. So that's one thing, a little different. Yeah, that must have been terrible to see. Yeah. Good thing you turned around, though. You never know. Yeah, you never know. No, I, I didn't want to take that risk. Didn't want to take that risk. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry about those technical difficulties. That's right. Uh, can you uh, tell me, tell us a little bit about the ice bowl? Yes. Uh, my, um, the girl I was dating and so forth at the time, uh, her uh, parents were from Green Bay and they had uh, Packer season tickets. And they also had tickets to any of the playoff games that were in Green Bay. And in 1967, uh, the Packers uh, and the Dallas Cowboys were playing in Green Bay for the NFL championship game. Uh, and it was, I think, in the first part of January uh, that they played the game. And it was scheduled for a Sunday. And the forecast actually was for uh, fairly reasonable conditions uh, and the like. Um, and uh, somehow, unexpectedly, a cold front moved in overnight. And we woke up the next morning, and it was almost a cloudless day, uh, bright sunshine, but it was 13 degrees below zero. Uh, and we were going to this game at around noon, noon and so forth. The game was still being held. Uh, so we dressed. Um, one of the things I decided to do was I was going to wear real tight shoes. I wear pairs of good wool socks uh, with slippers around them, and then I put overshoes around them. Oops. You can go. No, it's not a problem. That's good. Oh. Okay. That. Uh, I wore um, a couple pairs of socks, slippers over them, and then I wore over overshoes, rubber overshoes that you pull up and you could zip up and so forth over them. Because um, I knew my feet would be most subject to, to getting cold. Yeah, other than that, I just wore a couple, uh, several layers of clothes, a, a nice uh, uh, warm coat. Um, I wore a, um, a, a nice knit hat um, and a scarf wrapped over my, around my face, just a, a neck scarf you could wrap and just tie tight over your face. Um, and we were in the south end zone. Uh, that's where our seats were. And actually, uh, uh, fortunately, there was, the wind wasn't blowing uh, very hard, uh, but it was 13 degrees below zero. And one of the things I, 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 I'm from Minnesota, so you know how to keep, keep warm and you know when things are getting frostbite uh, so that you know what to do about it. And I knew for sure the key was to keep my feet moving, keep my toes moving, uh, keep my fingers moving. I wore big um, uh, wool mittens, not a, not a glove, wool mittens and a, a leather cover over those uh, wool mittens so that I, th these were mittens um, and so I, you don't separate the fingers or anything like that. So the whole hand is inside the mitten radiating heat out and it, keep, it tends to keep the hand warmer. So I kept moving my fingers and all that and I kept moving my toes. And actually it, it, went, it went fine. I, I don't think my toes started to get a little uncomfortable maybe towards the end of the game, and I was just kicking the ground and kicking this and kicking that just to, to keep uh, the blood circulating because um, it was getting a little numb. Um, what was most fascinating when you got out on the field and saw the players was you, you thought you'd feel sorry for yourself. I looked at the players and I said, it's 13 below and these guys are wearing these skin-tight uniforms. I felt so sorry for them. I mean, it was, and this, these are the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, they've never experienced weather like this, even the Green Bay Packers. 13 below is 13 below. It's cold. Um, and the, the Packers went out to and got two scores in the first quarter. Uh, little did 
they know, but uh, Lombardi had arranged for some electric coils to be placed underneath the field that would keep the field warm in the event that it would get cold so that it wouldn't ice over. Well, that didn't work too well because there was nothing to keep it from icing over. As soon as it melted and he saw it froze just instantly when it got to the top. So those coils didn't, didn't help much at all. It was so slippery out there. And when the, when the Packers scored the first two touchdowns or had 14 and I said, this is a ball game, we should go home. Because there's no way Dallas is going to score 14 points in this game. Well, they did. Um, they, uh, they scored on a, a fumble by uh, a uh, quarterback star. He, he fumbled the ball and they picked it up and ran into the end zone. And then uh, I'm trying to think um, what else. Oh, then they kicked a, a field goal. Uh, and so it was only 14 to 10 uh, at halftime. And then nobody was moving the ball. And in the third quarter, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the, the Cowboys tried a trick play where uh, the quarterback threw it to one of the halfbacks, who then threw it downfield to a guy that was just wide open. He scores, kicked that extra point, and the Packers were down 17 to 14. And nobody else scored in the third quarter, and there was hardly any score, nothing going on in the fourth quarter until about the last three minutes. And the Packers got the ball on the 50-yard line and were headed towards our end zone. And they started really moving the ball for the first time since they had scored 14 points in the first quarter. And just slowly moved downfield. The, the fans were getting more and more excited. But the biggest problem was getting downfield, just running the ball. He didn't want to take the risk of throwing the ball. Just running the ball. Um, and, um, and, that, and, 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 the, and the clock was, a, was, was, a, was an issue. So they got down. And they got down within inside the 10-yard line and then inside the five yard line and they basically had a, uh, I believe it was a third down play or something like that, but they really didn't, they, the best they could do was they could try to kick a field goal, um, excuse me, it was 17 to 14, they could try to kick a field goal on, on, on the time they had left uh, and would tied it, but Lombardi decided to go for the win and they had time to run only one more play and that was uh, the quarterback sneak by uh, Brett's, uh, Brett's uh, what was the quarterback's name? Um, Star was the yeah, quarterback's Bart name. Star. Bart Star, thank you. Bart Star had that quarterback sneak. It was right in the end zone, right in front of me. The, I'm telling you, the fans went absolutely nuts. That was the most exciting sequence of plays from midfield all the way down towards me I've ever seen in a football game. It was, it was truly remarkable. So that was my adventure at the Ice Bowl. And I tell people now, you know, you, you speak to somebody now, do you remember the ice bowl? Yeah, I heard about it. And then I tell them, well, I happen to be there. <laughs> and then they said, no way, you never were there. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> Crazy. So yes. that's my experience with the ice bowl. Yeah, to be there when they scored the touchdown. Like, yeah, right in front of me. People are still going crazy even though it's freezing out. Oh, sure. Because, I mean, everybody else was just during the rest of the game, which really was sort of boring, to be honest with you. There wasn't much excitement, very little offense. They were punting all the time. You know, you were just trying to keep warm and trying to move around and so forth. And there wasn't much to cheer about. Certainly what, But things got pretty somber when Packers got behind. And nobody thought that Dallas was going to have a chance in the game. And uh, so when they finally did start marching towards the end of the fourth quarter, everybody really got excited. And it was a thrilling three, four minutes, minutes that last, last, last drive. Wow. Um, moving on a little bit, can you just tell me what it was like growing up with eight brothers and sisters? So, <laughs> just, well, you... I'll tell you, it was interesting, and we're all still very close. That's we cool. are very close, all, all eight of us. Actually, I shouldn't say uh, all eight of us. My twin sister passed away several years ago. So there's only eight of us left, and, and I'm still very close to, to all my seven siblings. Uh, some live in uh, the Twin Cities, uh, some live in uh, uh, Florida, one lives in Texas, uh, um, uh, let's see, where does, uh, one lives in Chicago, uh, so they're sort of spread out a little bit. Anyway, um, but we all get together occasionally and uh, see each other, and we, I try to see most of them. Uh, uh, one lives in Ohio. So we see each other at least once a year, uh, uh, and uh, we're, 
still quite close, and we, we talked to each other a lot on the phone. Um, anyway, growing up like that, um, it was great. I was the oldest along with my twin sister. Um, it, it, it gives you some opportunities that you don't think of. Uh, for example, when I was uh, eight years old, and my brother was seven, my brother Dick was seven, my parents were more than happy to send us away to camp. My brother Dick and I, I mean, what the heck, they had five others. They didn't, they just as soon had unload a couple of them. <laughs> and we went out to this camp, uh, and they sent it out by, by ourselves. We went on a train the first year, overnight train, and my dad had somebody meet us when the train got to Rapid City, South Dakota. That's where the train took us. There was a camp in, inside the Black Hill area that was owned by this uh, parish priest in, in Rapid City, and it was a wonderful camp. Uh, and they had, um, they had counselors that were seminarians from, from St. Saint, from Saint Paul, as a matter of fact. But both my brother and I loved that camp so much, we had so much fun. So much fun. Uh, the, first of all, the counselors were great. They had a chapel on the ground. They had tents and cabins. They had a man-made lake for a nice swimming hole. The fishing was good. The, the hiking was just spectacular. The hiking, we'd go on overnight hikes and have a ball. They had a mess hall. Best thing they had, they had a basketball court. Best thing they had, though, was right in the middle of the grounds. They had a boxing ring. We had boxing matches every Friday night between kids from various tents or various cabins. And of course they all wore huge big gloves, they couldn't hurt each other, but they were so much fun to watch and cheer on and so forth. Anyway, we loved it. We went back the next year too, and we liked it so much we tried to convince our parents to let us stay for another two weeks and work with the workers uh, during, they had girls camp uh, the next two weeks so that we could stay longer. We did, and gosh, we had more fun with them. <laughs> that was just great. So that was a great summer, summer experience. Um, but growing up, um, I went to uh, a Catholic grade school. I had nuns every year, uh, except for one. <laughs> I remember every single nun I have had, and I remember by name. They were terrific. Um, I had only one lay teacher, and I remember her even more, because she, for some reason, had it out on me. She really gave me a hard time. Uh, but she taught me a very important lesson. I would get a report card from her, and on one side of the report card were conduct grades, there were four of them, and on the other side of the card was academic grades. And I'd look at the right side with the academic grades, and I got all A's or B's. I think I got a C in art, because I couldn't do anything in art and still can't. But on the left-hand side where the conduct grades were, I got four D's. And I thought to myself, what did I do to deserve this? And my dad was steamed. I mean, he was really upset. And I could never figure out uh, what she had it in for me. So, but I, I, she, I, she must have somehow expected something from me that I just wasn't providing her. I'll never forget one day, though, she taught me an extremely important lesson. I had a very bad habit of sucking my two fingers like this. Oh, really? Mm hmm. No. When I was a baby. Oh, okay. When I was a baby. The only problem was I kept this habit up even into grade school. So I was still sucking these two middle fingers when I was in second grade, which was sort of unheard of for somebody doing that. I had teeth marks right here. One day in class, she saw me do it. She saw me do it. And she said, well, Michael, that's interesting that you do that. Why don't you come up here and show everybody else what you do? She hauls me up in front of class, sets me on a chair, faces the class. Go ahead, Michael, put your fingers in your mouth. Go ahead. I, I, I was so embarrassed, I, and I'm esteemed that she was making me do this. So I had to put my fingers in my mouth. She just stay there and suck your fingers for a while. And she turns around and teaches class and left me like that for the whole period. <laughs> I was esteemed. But I'll tell you something. I never sucked again. Never. I took the next day. I wrapped my two fingers together with bandages so tight. And, and I had tried that before and, and, and never uh, really kept them on. But boy, I kept them on until I finally broke the habit. So I have to thank her for that. But she was an odd person. But anyway, I had good grade school years. I really did. I, I was a fairly good student and I was a good athlete. And I uh, was particularly happy and proud of, of being picked to be, to be able to serve Mass when I was in fourth grade. 
but we had to know all the Latin prayers. You had to memorize all the Latin prayers perfectly and had to know them because Mass was in Latin in those days. Yeah. And if you didn't know your Latin, goodbye, boy. Uh, they wouldn't even train you to be a server. So I was that, and also I made the, ba the, the school baseball team as a fourth grader, which it was, there was only two of us that did it. Uh, so I had, I had good years in, in grade school. And I had, I had a very good year in, in, in high school. I went to an all-boys high school. Uh, strangely enough, it was a military school, which was not uncommon in those days, where high schools were also military schools. The, the two big schools in the Twin Cities were in St. Paul, were both, both military schools. Uh, I didn't like the military part of it at all, but the, court, the courses were good and the teachers were great. And I had four particular teachers, one in freshman English, one in fresh, uh, uh, another one in uh, biology sophomore year, uh, chem, uh, excuse me, Latin, Latin two in sophomore year, and a higher algebra teacher in junior year. Those four men were fabulous teachers, just unreal, all in different ways. And that's what got me interested in teaching. I said to myself, if I could be a combination of those four men somehow and be so happy as they are in doing what they're doing, there must be something important in this profession. And that's what, that's what convinced me I wanted to go into education, those four men. So I did, and I don't regret it at all, not a minute. Uh, so when I went to Marquette University, I majored in science, but, uh, and I had been thinking about medicine, but uh, I started getting, I kept thinking of those four men, and I thought, I, I just, I think I want to be an educator. So I did, and that's what I finished my work at. Got a job right away. It was easy getting a job. A layman getting a job back in those days was nothing. I taught a pious for a year before I went uh, to back to Minnesota to go to graduate school, but then when I came back uh, after graduate school, I started teaching at Marquette High right away. Except for two years, 68 to 70, in which I was principal at Holy Angels. The last principal they had before they combined with DS. Two tough years, very tough. I didn't want to do that at all. I was pretty much roped into it by a, a Jesuit priest uh, who was in the education department at Marquette University, and the nuns went to him and asked him to find them a principal, a young man. And somehow, uh, <laughs> the president of Marquette High suggested that he talk to me about it. I could have killed him. Uh, and uh, it, he sort of whined and dined me, and I met various people at the school, but I, and I turned it down. And then the guy made me feel like a heel for abandoning Catholic education in Milwaukee. Abandoning Catholic education, come on. So I agreed to do it under a couple conditions, and it was just very difficult for me. And it, nothing against the school. The girls at Holy Angels were terrific. The nuns were terrific teachers. As administrators, they, they had some issues, but um, I just missed, I missed teaching so much. I didn't, being a principal is not teaching. Putting out fires, I said to myself, if I wanted to be a fireman, I would have taken fireman training. <laughs> I'm talking about issues among faculty and, 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 and so forth. Because, and, and I, I would, well, the thing I'd love to do when I was principal, go into a classroom and visit the classroom and just sit. That's what I'd love to do. So I would do that as much as I could. And then after two years, I was back in the classroom as a teacher, and I was happy ever since. And DS and HA joined together. And I was the one that suggested joining their names, and they did it. That's what, how it became DSHA. I was the one that made the suggestion to join the names. Oh. It wasn't technically a merger. The BVMs who owned Holy Angels actually sold the school to Mount Sinai Hospital. And uh, so it became a, not a merger legally uh, as far as assets and everything like that. It was just a, a way of con sort of continuing the name Holy Angels by joining the two names so that more girls would attend DS and and feel some identity as, as, a, as a student body under the name Holy Angels. And it was a smart decision on the part of DS to do that. So, uh, if you want, if there's some other things you want to ask? Yeah, I was just curious how the, I just can't imagine, you know, a military school 
having happy teachers. I just think, you know, like strict. Let me put it this way. The teachers at uh, St. Thomas Academy were all men. There were no women teachers at that time, except for the librarian. She was a woman, which was exactly the way it was at Marquette High for a while. The only exception was the librarian at Marquette High. But, uh, and there were very few priests, almost, they were almost all laymen, but they were terrific men. Um, the, the military part of it, there were military personnel who taught military at the school, and there was a lot of marching and all that type of thing, and a uniform, and, and it, 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 it was one of your classes. You take map reading and rifle range and how to take a hill and <laughs> all sorts of stuff that would, we'd have marches in full combat gear. We had an M-Run rifle we had to carry that weighed about 10 pounds. We had a helmet, steel helmet on that weighed about five pounds, almost broke my neck in that thing. It was the biggest waste of time I've ever, I've ever spent. But uh, that's, uh, that's the way it was. But despite that, ask Mr. Kelly sometime. He was, in, he was a student with me at that school at the same time. He was younger than I was, but he was there at the same time. Ask him how much he liked military. Mr. Kelly is, does the same thing I do here now. He does it. He does it for the star star program. He helps out the star kids a couple times a week. Uh, he works with Mr. Moiler in that that program. I hope to ask him next time I see him. Yeah, but he's an English teacher and a very good one. And uh, but he and I were together. That's we both hated military, but we both we both liked the school because of the teachers that were there. He and uh, did he. Was he one of the friends that asked you to come to Marquette? No. No. As a matter of fact, he didn't come to Marquette he, until after. He, he, he didn't come to Marquette, excuse me. He, he went to St. Norbert's for college and graduated and taught at Lake Mills High School for a number of years and then at Brookfield Central. And he didn't come to Marquette High until about 1980 or 79 or 80 with Mr. Carney. They were both hired the same year, both as English teachers. Mr. Carney was teaching at university school prior to that. And uh, Mr. Kelly was teaching at, uh, at Brookfield Central. But fortunately, they both, they both came the same year and they were just huge, great additions to Marquette High's faculty at the time. We got so many good faculty coming to Marquette High in the 80s, it was just terrific. And we still have a lot of good faculty now. Yeah. Would you be able to tell me a little bit about the nuns at Holy yes, at Holy Angels? Or, or what? No. no, well, I don't care, either group. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm trying to think. The, the Benedictine nuns I had for grade school were just great personalities, and I loved the way they teached, and they loved uh, interaction with their kids, both on the playground and in the class, loved to talk to you outside of class. Uh, they were just all just very, very nice and some very good teachers. Uh, but they didn't take any crap or anything from us. Uh, and I'll tell you, we spent 99% of our time in grade school teaching, only, uh, learning only two subjects, English and math. I mean, I knew how to write a sentence so well by the time I got out of grade school that any English course I ever took after that was sort of meaningless because it was just a repeat of what I had in grade school. I even knew more in grade school than I ever were required to know in high school. Uh, and, uh, and I had fairly good math skills as well, so I had, I had no trouble in math either in high school. Uh, except I had a terrible teacher my first year, but outside of that, uh, fortunately, I, first two years I had him. Fortunately, that one teacher I mentioned for higher algebra, he taught me more math in two weeks than the other guy taught me in two years. Uh, he was a great guy. Uh, the BBMs at Holy Angels, good teachers, very good teachers, but they were going through a difficult time with their order and the structure of their order, and it caused a lot of consternation amongst the sisters. Uh, they removed local superiors. By that I'm referring to the nuns would live in community and they would have one, one person that was the, the head of the community that was sort of like the mother of the community. They removed that and, and ran the community by sort of a, a group of sisters rather than just one individual. It was very difficult for the older sisters to adjust to. Um, they had to they had to apply for jobs in their own high schools 
uh, just like a layperson did. They weren't automatically assigned to a high school, so their their job security all of a sudden was in question. Um, and especially the older ones had an extremely difficult time in dealing with that. You know, I felt so sorry for the older nuns, particularly. And unfortunately, there was some nun, younger group of nuns uh, that weren't as understanding of the difficulties that the older t nuns were having. And they, they liked the changes because it was more in fashion with what's what's uh, suitable for, let's say, some of the younger nuns to be a little bit freer and so forth and not so obedience bound. In any way, it caused a lot of consternation in the, in the uh, structure of the order and they had difficulty controlling their sisters as a result of that and losing, losing, losing more and more sisters each year. The Jesuits have always been smart that, that in any community they always have a local superior in any community. Uh, they have a community at Marquette University, too, at Marquette University, and they have a community at Marquette High School, too. So it's, it's, it's important. The community is a very important part of Jesuit formation. Were there more Jesuits when you were teaching? A lot more. You know what a scholastic is? There's a Jesuit who's just in training. He's only been here for like three years. Then he moves on in his training. We had maybe we maybe had 15 or 16 scholastics here at the time. We had maybe, when I started here, we probably had 50 Jesuits. We had maybe 10 laymen. So we had uh, many, many fewer. But the Jesuits were smart enough to realize that they weren't going to continue to get the vocations that they had gotten, and therefore they were going to get fewer and fewer uh, people actually teaching in the high school. And they knew they had to hire good lay teachers to to uh, replace them. And they were very, very careful about once they made a good hire to show us the way of what made a Jesuit education a little, uh, a little special. You've all heard the term curia per personalis, oh, yeah. and and dealing with the whole the whole man. Uh, that was that was from the get go way back even when I was hired. That it's as important what you do with the kids outside the classroom as what you do with them inside the classroom. And that uh, the principles of, of a Jesuit education should be apparent in both environments, both in the classroom and outside the classroom. So that's why all the faculty are, are involved in retreats and running organizations and coaching sports and running clubs and that type of thing. Uh, that's an important part of, 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 of being a teacher here at Marquette High School. And we make it very clear when they hire a teacher at Marquette High School, if you're not willing to buy into that extra responsibility, you might be better off someplace else. Are the Jesuits one of the reasons you decided to switch from Pius to Marquette? They were the reason. The guy that was ahead of me, or that was ahead of me, the guy I worked under in graduate school at the University of Minnesota, asked what I was going to do after I finished my master's degree, and I said, I'm going to go into teaching high school. And he said, uh, where? And I said, well, probably in St. Paul. He said, well, do you ever consider a Jesuit school? And I said, well, there are no Jesuit schools in St. Paul. And he said, yes, I know. But there are a couple Jesuit schools in Wisconsin that are looking for somebody to, to teach there. And I said to him point blank, I said, okay, fine. Well, what's so special about a Jesuit school? You know what he said to me? You'll find out as soon as you get to as soon as you get to one. That's all he told me. Because it's different. It's totally different. He was right. He's right. He's 100% right. That's really special. I would never. I mean, that's why the Jesuit schools are so successful around the United States. Heck, you'd be surprised the number of faculty that and you've had as teachers here went to St. Ignatius in Cleveland. No. Yeah, about six, six or seven of them are graduates from St. Ignatius in Cleveland. Not Marquette High. No, I don't know. Yeah, now we're gonna, we had a lot of questions about teaching, so would you like to talk a little bit about the uh, music growing up? The music growing up? Well, big transition in the middle 50s, Elvis Presley and rock and roll and then followed immediately by the Beatles. So I was making a transition from the old traditional hit parade music where it didn't make any difference who was singing the song 
to rock and roll where it made a huge difference as to who was singing the song. Huge difference. And so rock and roll and uh, uh, the Beatles and so forth became the rage. So I was very much in, into rock, but I, I do remember some sage, or a sage comment made by somebody said, that's great, but someday you're going to love classical music. And they were 100% right. I love classical music. I'm not interested in rock and roll anymore at all. When I became an adult, I started appreciating why some music is called classical and other forms of music aren't. What was your favorite band? Or music? My favorite what? Uh, musician growing up. Favorite musicians? Yeah. Well, if you really want to know who my favorite musicians are, I mean, I would say uh, Mozart and Beethoven. Uh, they're, they're composers, principally. Oh, yeah. Yeah, those are my fa I think those are the best composers that ever lived, both of them. There are many others I think are great. Uh, I, I liked uh, some of the more, uh, the music that was... Uh, it, uh, popular in the 70s uh, and in the 60s. Uh, the one concert I want, went to here in Milwaukee, you know who it was? Elton John and uh, Billy Joel. Have you ever heard of those two? Yeah, Billy Joel. Play. Billy Joel and Elton John were here in county, st in, in, in county Stadium for a concert, and it was just a huge success. Huge success. That was the best concert that I've ever, one of the only only concerts I've ever been at, except for, let's say, a performance by the Milwaukee Symphony or some other orchestras. Best best production I've ever heard, an actual concert that I enjoyed the most, was a, uh, I don't know what they played, but uh, I had a chance to hear the Chicago Symphony play once. And talk about a good symphony. Boy, they're good. They are really special. Yeah. Um I remember during the pre-interview, you said something about saddle shoes. And I saddle that was shoes. Kind of funny. Well, one of your questions on the thing was, what was the style of dress, yeah. or what style of dress I had? Well, I'll tell you something. See me now? Yeah. That was it. Really? Haven't changed. That shirt that was a button-down shirt, a sweater that was either like this, a sleeveless sweater, or a long sleeve sweater, and and just in a in a shirt with a collar and khaki pants. In the wintertime, we would wear corduroy pants. I don't know if you know what those are. Oh, yeah. uh, good corduroy pants, and usually in a sort of a khaki or brownish or sometimes uh, gray color. Uh, there was another fabric that was used called tweederoid, <laughs> tweederoid, which were sort of dark colored pants, but had little specks of white uh, material or uh, white threads in them. They were called tweederoid. But anyway, those were the pants we wore, uh, shoes, Pretty much a standard Oxford shoe. I don't know if you know what an Oxford shoe is like. Uh, this is somewhat of an Oxford style shoe, the one I'm wearing right now. Pretty standard Oxford shoe. Um, and then tennis shoes, uh, but we could never wear tennis shoes at school. Never. Uh, girls couldn't wear, girls had to wear patent leather shoes. You know what patent leather is? I don't think I've ever heard of that or seen it. Patent leather is shoes that girls wear, and their patent leather is very shiny leather. It's just it, you don't have to polish it. It's very very shiny leather, black. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> there was a play written by a very funny guy called "Do Patent Shed Leather Shoes Really Reflect Up?" <laughs> what a title! Uh, but anyway, uh, and then they all wore dresses which it, obviously it's coming back to do, I knew it would happen, but you see more and more, certainly more and more faculty women and more high school age girls are wearing dresses these days, don't you agree? I guess you don't. Yeah, I don't really, can't really tell now. Yeah, but uh, I just think it's becoming much more common to, uh, for dresses to come back. Um, but the saddle shoes, um, I, um, I first noticed saddle shoes when I was watching uh, uh, golf, that a lot of golfers would wear a, a saddle type shoe where the, sh the golf shoe was all white except for the saddle portion, which was, the saddle portion would be like here over to there, but this would be all white, um, the backs would be white, the only thing that would be colored black or brown or something would be just sort of the saddle shoe that went, went across it. 
and they'd have saddle shoes that were all white and the saddle was black or they'd have all white and the saddle was uh, brown and then the sole would be either brown or, or, or a black depending upon what the color of the saddle was. And um, then all of a sudden I started seeing them advertised in the stores uh, without golf corks in them and I decided to get a pair and I started wearing a pair. This was like in seventh grade. And of course, everybody looked at them when I first walked around with them, but I didn't care. And soon enough, boy, I'll tell you, the few guys at school started getting a pair. Because, you know why? The girls, the girls were always wondering about them. Oh, really? Yes, that's... the girls were always wondering about them. So that's why the guys got them. Uh, and um, so I sort of started a sh saddle shoe f uh, fan, so to speak, or a, uh, trend in, in the latter grades in the 50s that uh, I on for a while I'm on for a while I don't wear any I don't have any more it's they started to come back to shortly another shoe that was very popular along the same time saddle shoes was, was called a white buck shoe I don't know if you ever heard of Patrick Boone but he was one of the big singers in the 60s and he was famous for wearing white buck shoes and it was sort of like a uh, sort of a felty uh, top to the shoe. Uh, uh, felt like buckskin, but it was all white, and it had a, um, it had sort of a crepe, uh, reddish color sole, white buck shoe. They became very popular. Why, I have no idea. Something different. Yeah, something's always trending. Yeah. But I was, as far as a dresser, <laughs> what you see is, I've worn it my whole adult life. I do, I do not go into trends with, uh, when I buy a, a pair of pants or I buy a shirt or I buy a sweater or I buy a tie, I want something that'll be in fashion for a long time. And I say to guys, for example, when you buy ties, don't worry about the width. Just make sure you buy some ties that are plain, some ties that have stripe, some ties that have maybe polka dot, and that's all you have to worry about because some of those will always be in style. That's true. Always be in style. Or sometimes now, no tie. Yeah, no? too. Yeah, it's very common where it's no tie. I think every time I've seen you, I've seen you with a sweater. Uh, I wear sweaters all the time. As a matter of fact, uh, one, one of my students uh, commented, few, this was several years ago, Mr. Donovan, you seem to have more sweaters than just about anybody. And I said, well, I take care of them because I know I, that's all I'm going to wear. That's all I'm going to wear. And uh, especially when you live in the climate that we live. Oh, yeah. To change moods a little bit, do you mind? I know I didn't have this on the um, question sheet I gave you, but would you mind telling me about your uh, marriage? Uh, yeah, I... Um, I guess I'll say this, I, I've been married twice. Uh, I, had a, I have a daughter from the first marriage uh, who's out in Oregon right now. She's about 52, and that marriage broke up and, 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 uh, and she's passed away. Um, it, was, it was sad, uh, particularly for my daughter. Um, and then I fortunately remarried in, in 1990. Uh, uh, and my wife and I have a son now who's 27. So he's my son and a great guy and he went to Marquette High and he's done very, very well, very, very well. It was a very easy child to, to uh, raise and uh, both Peggy and I are very, very happy uh, with each other and with him. Uh, he, <laughs> he was born with genes that said, uh, how can I best please my parents? Because so. that's all he ever did. I mean, he never had any tantrums. He never did anything that we disapproved of. I mean, it was, we were always waiting for the other shoe to drop. <laughs> I mean, it just never did. He's always been a good student. He was a good student in college. And it's not that he's an introvert or anything. He's very much an extrovert in a way. He's a good people person. He's got great people skills. Uh, he's very generous with his time. He, he mentors uh, kids that are in, business, in the business school at Marquette University now that he's out of there. Uh, he was he was considered one of the top business graduates in his senior year at Marquette University. 
uh, he won the award for the uh, highest ranking real estate uh, person uh, in the business school. And he got a nice scholarship uh, to go to Marquette University from Marquette High School because he was the top student from Marquette High who, who applied and accepted at the business school at Marquette. So he got some nice help. Or I should say, we got some nice help. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, Sorry you're welcome. Your you're welcome. No, that's okay. So maybe uh, now I would like to change the subject again. Uh, would you mind telling me about where, where and what you were doing when JFK was assassinated? Uh, I, when JFK was assassinated, I had been doing my practice teaching. I, the, the last year of, of uh, the senior year, my senior year, I did my practice teaching. In order to get licensed to teach, you have to uh, take an eight credit course at, from the university in which during that course you, you get assigned to a particular public school and you teach, you have to be able to teach two subjects. Um, and we only had to teach one class in each of those subjects. Um, and I was assigned to Custer High School. I don't know if you know where that is, but it's out on Sherman Boulevard. Uh, it's not considered a particularly strong school now, but it was a very good public school at the time I was teaching there. And I was assigned to teach um, a chemistry class, uh, an advanced chemistry class, and a biology class. <laughs> you're supposed to have a cooperating teacher at the school to help you learn the ropes, so to speak, and I had a terrific one in the chemistry class. She was just superb. She taught me so much. Uh, I was more than happy to work for her uh, and take over her class, and she gave me a lot of good tips. My biology teacher, not so great. He introduces himself the very first day. He said, this is the textbook, this is the syllabus, and here are your kids. Goodbye. Never saw him again the rest of the semester. Wow. <laughs> Never saw him again. I said, well, thanks, buddy. You were a lot of help. So anyway, I was towards the end of my the semester. Uh, it was in November. Um, and I was on my way back from Custer High School. Uh, and I was coming back uh, right after lunch because I taught the classes in the morning and so forth. And um, all of a sudden, I had the radio on. And over the radio, it says, uh, news bulletin from Dallas. President Kennedy has been shot. Uh, I didn't even know he was in Dallas. And uh, so I first heard it on the radio while I was driving back to Market, uh, Market U from Custer High School. And I was, um, I got back to campus and of course everybody was listening to the radio and all that. It was real cold at the time. And this was on, a, I can't remember what day, it was towards the end of the week. Uh, the 23rd and um, because we were all sort of uh, huddled up to the TV uh, over the weekend uh, listening to the funeral and all that and uh, what they were finding out about Lee Harvey Oswald and, and then he was shot after a couple of days and um, wondering about uh, what was going on there um, and uh, so that's, that's how I heard about it. And uh, at that time, I, I frankly was not a big Jack Kennedy fan, to be honest with you. I was, I was more of a Republican at that time. Um, I have switch, switched my politics significantly <laughs> uh, since that time, largely due to Donald Trump. I can't believe we elected that clown a president. Sorry, I hope. If that offends either one of you or, or your parents, that's just the way I feel. And what frightens me more, if he would get reelected, oh man, I think I'd move to Canada. So, Can you imagine what another presidency would be like with that clown in the White House? Yeah, sounds so. I mean, the guy's a nut. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the way I feel about it. No, that's fine. <laughs> this is your time to talk. <laughs> Am I in safe company? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, and, and what bothers me even worse is some very bright, good Republicans stick with the clown and are just gutless to speak up. Just terribly gutless. 
it bothers my wife especially. Uh, and they're just concerned about their own hind ends and preserving those. They're afraid to step out in the cold and uh, raise the ire of, of his supporters. And um, it's just, uh, I pray to God that uh, I, I honestly think if he is the nominee again, he'll, he'll get beaten again, he'll get beat even worse, and finally he'll drop off the scene, hopefully. So anyway, I'm no longer a Republican, at least <laughs> not the way the Republican Party is run now. I'm, you know, somewhat a conservative guy. I'm for smaller rather than larger government and fiscal restraints and not borrowing a lot of money and making sure that if you got money to, to spend that you haven't necessarily borrowed it, that you've maybe saved it first. Uh, so, but not the attitude that uh, the Republicans seem to have now. Backtracking a little bit, this is this is kind of out of the blue, but do you think uh, Kennedy was assassinated by the CIA or anything? You know, I I'll be honest with you. I would not totally be surprised at all that if there were others involved and that there was a conspiracy. It just, the, the single assassin just seems to be such an improbable situation to me. I, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it, yeah. it didn't happen, but just so improbable, and that there, there were other things observed and so forth that would indicate that there were other others involved on the grassy knoll. I just think the grassy knoll was, uh, 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 a location in which there were other others trying to shoot at him too, uh, but um, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Uh, 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 Castro was no friend of Kennedy a bit because of the Bay of Pigs. Um, the Mafia was no friend of Kennedy's. Uh, they were not happy uh, about his relationship to Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. Not at all. And they felt that uh, his actions uh, and behavior when he was out at Las Vegas and so forth uh, with other women were very, uh, very significant in crossing the mafia. They were, they were very mad at him, so I wouldn't be surprised they were involved either. What was the public opinion of, at the time of yeah, Kennedy? Well, of Kennedy? Well, you know, he was sort of a, he was a charming guy, he was a handsome guy, he was uh, sort of a popular president uh, just because of some of the great speeches he gave and the speech that he gave in Berlin, uh, I am a Berliner, uh, and all that type of thing, you know, it was synonymous to Reagan in the 80s saying, oh, Gorbachev, won't you take down this wall, and all that type of thing. So he, he had good speech writers, and I don't mean to suggest that he didn't have good thinking on himself. He handled the Cuban Missile Crisis very well. I really can't fault him for that. Uh, he was smart enough to listen to some good advisors. I think Bobby Kennedy, his younger brother, was really the brains between the two of them. Uh, he was a very smart guy, Bobby Kennedy. Matter of fact, I didn't tell you this. You know who I got my diploma from to graduate from Marquette University? Who gave it to you? Bobby Kennedy. Really? The Bobby Kennedy put it in my hand and shook my hand and congratulated me. Wow. He was the commencement speaker at Marquette University in 1964. Wow. Yeah, he was attorney general at the time. Oh, no, excuse me, was he attorney general? No, I think he had just left that post. I can't, I can't remember. Might have been still the attorney general. But anyway, no, I think he may have still been. Uh, I think once Johnson got <laughs> once Johnson got elected, uh, Bobby Kennedy was no longer Attorney General. <laughs> anyway, do you mind uh, telling us about the uh, commencement speech by Kennedy? Um, 
you know something uh t just t just a second hold the line can we stop at this time Brian? yeah i need to make a call yeah that's fine. do you mind telling us about the uh commencement speech by Bobby i'll be honest with you i hardly remember anything about it so. yeah um i i think the one thing i do remember about it was uh, how difficult it was to deal with him personally with his brother's death um, and because um, this was in 1964 and it was only a year afterwards um, and how much he admired him uh, and uh, he also mentioned about the challenges in the Cub Cuban Missile Crisis that uh, we, th we think we, we approached it the same uh, the right way and, um, and then he also had a lot to say about civil rights he was very, very much concerned about the civil rights movement, that things had to change, particularly in terms of uh, guaranteeing the right to vote, guaranteeing the right to vote throughout the United States, and that was in jeopardy. You know, there, was, there were places down in the South where uh, uh, Negroes, as they were called at that time, still weren't permitted to register to vote. So that was a big move to end that situation. So he did make uh, some address those those issues too, uh, but that's pretty much all I remember. Yeah, I guess one last finishing question would be: Is there anything I missed that? You want no, to I think you covered most of it. Um, I really can't think of anything else uh, that all that significant uh, that really would be worth noting, so to speak. Uh, I've been very fortunate in my life uh, in that um, I've had a wonderful, wonderful parents, wonderful siblings. Um, uh, I, I, I appreciate the fact that I had two marriages, uh, but the uh, first marriage was just unfortunate because the health of my wife was not good. Um, but uh, I've been very happily married uh, after that, and I've had two wonderful children that couldn't make me prouder and I was very very fortunate to have chosen a vocation that I absolutely loved and was able to uh, 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 fulfill uh, my whole life uh, and it's that's why I'm still connected to Marquette High School so awesome. I, I'm a very very uh, very very happy man I have good friends and most of which have been as a result of contact through the faculty and staff here. So that's pretty much well, all I can really think of. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Hope it goes well for you. And yeah, Jacob, thank you for help. Nice.